message to bear. Uh, inspire us, exhort us, correct us, move us, please, in this time we have tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a lot of, I'm friends with a lot of different kinds of pastors, and uh, I get to see kind of how they do things, what ministry ideas they have, how they minister. I've got a friend who's a pastor down in Ramsey, they just bought a bus so that they could go and pick up children uh, from their neighborhoods on Wednesday nights, and they have, uh, like a, I think it's King's Kids or something like that, but, uh, you know, they, that's been a really great thing for them. They've had some people saved and join the church from that. Um, so that's been that's been really great to pray for and, and watch. And um, we've seen other pastors try to set up, you know, coffee stations and coffee shops in their churches. And uh, some of them have a prophet's chamber where they where a missionary or a preacher can come in and they can stay there. And there's a lot of different ways that, that pastors are trying to reach their communities. And... Uh, there's always this question for some of the some of the younger guys especially that are very much into marketing and the quantifiable metrics of sociology in a way they're always like what's the what's the cutting edge thing what's the next thing you know what what kind of mug can we give out on Easter Sunday morning you know what kind of thing can we do and and I appreciate I at least appreciate the idea of trying to reach out to their community and trying to um, have ideas for ministering. Um, when you ask the question though, what is the best way to do that? What's the best thing a church should have? You know, you could have just one thing, money, building, talents, time, people, or no object, then what would be the thing that the church should heavily invest in? What should the, be the thing that the church wants or needs to do? And again, it looks different for every church. Uh, it looks different for our church as well. Paul is writing to the church here in Colossae, and he, he, we're not sure if he'd ever been there. It seems like probably he'd never been to the church in Colossae, but he wants them to know what are the best things for them. Now, I'll say this, not to be pious, and I'm not saying that we're against anything like a bus or a prophet's chamber or uh, you know, outreach opportunities. In fact, I have, I have some outreach op, um, ideas that I want to try to help our church kind of catch and run with. Um, I'll say this real quickly. Part of the reason I don't put a lot of ideas out there is because most of those ideas come back to me, and it's more for me to do. And if I have a plate that's pretty full, I'm not necessarily looking to do more. I'm looking to do the things that I'm doing better so that I can do more. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not looking to do more. I'm just saying I'm kind of tapped out already. So, But if, if there are some other things that we as a church can do, then I'm, I'm definitely interested in that. But not to be pious and say we don't, we don't focus on those things. But I would say definitely the things that our, church has, has, that our church has focused on in order to prosper and do what we can, I would say first of all is a love for one another. We really try to cultivate the fact that we are a church family that loves one another. The second, not in any particular order, but another might be uh, scriptural understanding. Understanding the Bible for what it is so that the Bible can change your life. You can take it home, you read it, you get into it, and God speaks to you through it. And uh, then we see things like what Russ was talking about. God's working in his heart and using the Bible to make some changes and, and to encourage him and to help him. And man, I, I don't know about you, but I want that for me. Right? All of us want that. That's great. And the other thing would be then just a gospel focus, a uh, focus on the gospel here and abroad. So Paul is going to be writing to the church in Colossae, and again, it's not sure, probably he'd never been there before, but he was acquainted with some of the people. Uh, he's writing to them, and again, Colossae is in uh, what we would call Turkey today, but it was in, you know, Asia Minor, and, uh, and in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I would, or I wish... That, that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Okay, so he, he knew that the letter would be circulated among the Gentile churches. In fact, at the very end of the book, he says, send this letter to those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And when you get my letter from them, read it in your church. So there was a connection between these churches. Um, Laodicea was only 12 miles west of Colossae, and Hierapolis was 15 miles, um, I think, south. 
and or north. And so these three cities, at least, there was some communion, not only between the cities, but also between the churches. And so he's writing, in a way, not just to the church in Colossae, but all the churches in this region. Perhaps some of them had been saved since Paul had first sent people there. Maybe people, again, we talked about this the very first Sunday that we talked about Colossians, but it could be that Paul was ministering in, in Ephesus, met some people from Colossae, they took the gospel back to the to Colossae and to those other places and started preaching the gospel and people getting saved. And Paul's, you know, he knew them, but then there were some people that had never seen his face and they didn't really know what Paul was all about. And so Paul's writing to them and saying, even though I haven't met some of you, I have a great conflict for you. Now the word great conflict is really the, is the word that they would use for uh, like the Olympic Greek Games. It was a place where competition took place. So we would, you know, again, we don't really think of, like in a football arena, we don't really think of them as really, like, going at it. But, like, there's an actual conflict. I mean, there's sportsmanship and things. But this was the idea in, like, a coliseum or in the, in the games where there was actual conflict. And so this is the idea that Paul Paul's like, I, am, I, am, I feel like I'm, I'm in competition. I feel like I'm striving for you. I feel like I'm like an athlete who's trying to do something for you. And he had said again that he was preaching the mystery of the Gentiles in verses 26 through 28 of chapter 1. I'll just read it real quickly. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And again, the idea of the mystery is that the Gentiles have been brought into communion with the Jews and with Jesus, that both Jews and Gentiles make up God's people, the new people of God, the new nation of God, the church. And that his focus wasn't just on national Israel. So now he's writing to them with great conflict. And he wanted them to know their place in the plan of God. Paul had a desire for the churches in the area. And, and what were his desires? And he says, what's the, thi what, what's the thing that Paul wants for them? Not just this church in Colossae, but all the churches there. What was he striving in prayer that they might accomplish? One is for encouragement or comfort. Notice he says, I would, again, verse 1, I would that he knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. What? That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. That their hearts might be comforted. The word comfort means to call near. It's the idea, it's translated in other places in the Bible, exhort, or desire, or often entreat, or to beseech. He's pleading with them. And the idea is that they would be able to plead with one another, that they'd be able to encourage one another, that there would be, like we talked about this morning, this daily exhortation of one another. How? Being knit together. Now again, that knit together word means compacted. This is translated compacted in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, talking about the body, how it's been driven together. And our body, again, is is. Like what we were talking about, I was helping with the kids with uh, homeschooling this week, and uh, I think I was talking with the boys, and they said, uh, what was it, guys, do you remember? Like something about your skin, and there's like 20 miles of blood vessels under your skin, and what, one inch, one square inch of skin, there's 20 miles of blood vessels, is that, is that right? It wasn't feet, it was, it was like, I don't know, but anyway, it's amazing the stuff that's packed into your body. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing the way that God has knit us together. And that's the idea of, whatever, I don't care. Uh, that he has compacted us together. And that's what God has done in the church. He's put us together. And so in that, he's saying, you, uh, my prayer for you, my conflict for you is that your hearts might be comforted since you are so knit together, since you're so interconnected that that encouragement, that 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 love for one another would spur you on. Why? Because love is, again, binding in the Christian church. Love is really, uh, it's, it's the love of Christ 
that compels us. Love, you can say, is the blood of the church. Jesus said it again, John 13, verses 34 and 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. What is going to preach Christ in Park Rapids? Love, that we love people, that we care about them, that we, uh, that we are different in a lot of ways. And when you find a church that's bickering and that's fighting, where there's turmoil and conflict, yes. that there's a, that's a sick body. And you know, that, that's, that's something where there's, there's, there's a need for some help and some health. Um, again, when there is conflict, when there, is, when there are problems, then uh, that reaction to that uh, is often this knitting together. So we're seeing, again, in Ukraine, the people of Ukraine coming together. We're seeing churches coming together like never before. We're seeing uh, Mark uh, and Lydia having new opportunities to minister to other people because of this conflict. And, and you, you never know that you have a need for somebody else until you're in crisis. We are often pretty independent and we feel like we don't need other people until there's a problem. And uh, wouldn't it be great if we just knew that we needed one another all the time and not just in those times of conflict? We need to understand that we are always under attack. See, when, when I'm in trouble, it's when I feel like I need people. The problem is that I'm always in trouble. Without Christ, I can do nothing. I'm always under attack. I'm always at the mercy of Satan and my flesh and the world, and they're always coming after me. And I need a group of people that I'm knit together with in love to comfort me, to help me, to encourage me. I need that. The false teachers wouldn't do that for them. Later on, again, in this chapter, we'll read about these false teachers. All the false teachers can talk about is why they're right, why they need to be listened to, why their words need to be heeded. But the love that they were preaching is not love for each other, but love for them. And I, I, I submit to you that a healthy church, it would be a healthy it would be a healthier thing for a church to ignore the pastor and love one another than to be totally devoted to a pastor. And I've seen churches where they're totally devoted to the pastor. And what does that breed in the church? It actually breeds contention within the church because they're all kind of vying for that powerful position. And uh, I, just don't, I just don't see that in scripture. I see there, I see, again, the pastors, I'm a part of the church just as much as anybody else, but I'm not any better than anybody. I may have different giftings and talents that I have, but I don't have better ones. I mean, we're all being, again, knit together, and, and the false teachers wouldn't help with that. So, one thing for Pastor Hunt to get up and say, through the authority of Scripture, we ought to be comforting one another and encouraging one another. We ought to dwell in love, but what does that actually look like? One, I think it looks like watchfulness that we all need to take it as our responsibility. And again, often, and I don't mind this, okay, don't hear me say, I wish you wouldn't do that, okay? Often what people will say is, Pastor, someone told me about a need. Would you meet that need? And I want to say this, if God put that person in your life, That's right. God wants you to meet that need. Right. Now, I'm happy to do that. I'm absolutely happy to do that, you know, and, and there have been times um, that I've, uh, that I've been able to, you know, if I can, I will go and visit the person, I'll go and help, and I, if you ever wanted to come in, like, if, if you wanted to come in and say, Pastor, can we meet with you on a Tuesday morning at uh, 11 o'clock, and we just want to come in for a half an hour, and we're going to pray for my children, we have some specific things, oh man, that would be great. That would be awesome. And if you wanted me to write them a letter, I would absolutely do that. And, and I would join you in that, but not do it in your stead. Yeah. You got a coworker, you got a neighbor, God's put you in their life. I don't ask you to go over to my neighbor's house and witness to them. Now, you might be more effective than I would be, but God's put me in their life. And, uh, and so this watchfulness means that I'm taking responsibility. Now, I just gave you a bunch of examples of people outside the church, but what about people in the church? Um, I've been so, so encouraged with the way that people have been telling me what's going on in the church that I'm not always the one reporting. It's been so encouraging to hear. Like, for instance, Marlene had some real health issues this week. And uh, when I, by the time I found out about it, Terry was already taking care of Marlene. I love how well you love our sister. 
That is just great. That is a knitting together. And uh, when and, and Julie and Rod, I just, I, again, I hate to say this over and over and over again, but you guys were so helpful and instrumental in keeping the church together during COVID. You were always on the phone and just keeping people encouraged and knit together, and that was such an encouragement. Now, I know that there are a lot of other people who do those same things, and I'm not trying to overlook anybody. I'm just trying to say we have some great examples in our church of doing that very thing, and, and let's move forward in that in greater ways, to be knit together, to encourage one another, to, to have that love flowing through us, and to take it as my responsibility. I see somebody who's down. I see somebody who's, like we talked about this morning, hardening their heart. It's my responsibility to do what I can to go and help that person. Romans 15, 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Very easy to be like, not my problem. I've got other things I'm dealing with. I couldn't possibly be imposed to help somebody else. That's the easy way. The harder thing is to say, I'm going to help them bear their burdens because they've got burdens that they cannot bear alone. They need my help. Uh, another verse that talks about that is Galatians 6, 2, which says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So it looks like watchfulness. It also looks like investment, getting involved in one another's life. Um, you don't know how to help them, how to encourage them, unless you know them. And especially, especially in a northern culture, where we have these walls, you know, Minnesotans have these walls, and we don't necessarily want people in those walls. And uh, But isn't it true that if some random person comes up to you and says, I'd like to help you, you're not very probably apt to say, sure, I'll let you help me. But if it's someone that you know, someone that cares about you, someone that you know, that they're a lot more apt to say, Yes, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to let you come into my life. Now, sometimes that looks like a lot of time that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. But often what you're doing is building relationship. So it's that checking in. It's the, hey, let's get coffee. Hey, let's have lunch. Hey, why don't you come over to my house? Hey, can I come over to your house and even just sit with you for a while? And, and again, uh, it may feel like you're maybe not getting anywhere, but you are because you're investing in them. You're knitting yourself together with that person. And when there's a conflict, when there's a problem, it takes a long time. It's taken me a long time with some of these officers to get them to open up to me. It's, it's taken a long time with some of the people in the community that I've been talking to and talking to and talking to and praying for. It's, been, it's taken a long time for, me to, for them to open up to me, especially as a pastor, right? But um, that investment is well worth it. Now, again, that's true in your community. It's also true in your church to make that investment. Um, it takes time and the investment in others in, in order to reap the benefits of help. Just like any kind of gardening thing, right? No, I think people that, that hear about gardening think, oh, it's great, I'm gonna throw the seeds in the ground, go out there the next day and get the cucumbers. You know? It's like people who are gardening are like, you know, it takes a lot more work. And, and the more you know about gardening, the more work it takes, right? <laughs> I mean, Rod's already started his garden, and there's two feet of snow out there. I mean, he hasn't put anything in the ground when he started it, right? You just know, like, it just takes time before you get fruit. And so right. you do that. So, again, uh, what does it look like? It looks like watchfulness. It looks like investment. It also just looks like loving actions. Not just love, but loving actions. And let the Holy Spirit direct you into what those loving actions are. So how are the churches going to survive? How are these churches in Colossae and Hierapolis and Laodicea going to survive? They're going to survive with love. That's one of the things that the church needs. The second thing is to understand the gospel. Now, it's a little funny in verse 2. Um, feels like there should be a verb there. Um, but I don't know enough about Greek to say, yes, there should. I'm just saying, it reads a little funny. Verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of the understanding of the, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. Okay, so the word, and unto, is, uh, is a word that means moving toward. Right? Moving toward what? Moving toward... All riches of the full assurance. Okay, those are, again, descriptor phrases. What are we getting to? Understanding. Moving toward understanding. That's what God has called us to do. 
He's saying, I'm praying that God, that God uh, would knit your, that would comfort you by knitting your heart together. I'm praying that he would move you toward understanding, that he would help you put together and comprehend what God's doing in your life. Now, of what? What is, what understanding of what? Uh, of the mystery of God. Now again, we already talked about this in chapter 1, but the part of the mystery was that Gentiles are now part of the heritage of God. That God has brought the Jews and the Gentiles together to himself, and that you, Colossian, as a Gentile, have a relationship with God that you couldn't have expected before, but now you can enjoy that relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. We get to be partakers of God, the Father, and Christ. And again, which is, I think, an allusion to the Trinity there at the end of verse number two. So uh, there is this uniting message, I believe, of the gospel, that this mystery, this, this good news, there's this uniting message message of the gospel for the church. And again, this is what often you see in our society. Again, talking about marketing, you'll have a brand that they want everybody to get on the same page. You know, they have their, their talking points and, and they have their, uh, this is what we're emphasizing. You know, in our, in, in, I think every organization that's going to stay together has that unifying message. In, in our family, we have uh, a, a basis of love, of respect for each other, and we want to make Christ central in our family. And uh, so those are always the points that we're pointing back to in our family. Um, USA, the USA right now is struggling because we don't have a united message. Right? We, we don't have, we, we rally, like uh, I, I just read something, CNN said that uh, Joe Biden's poll numbers have gone way, his uh, approval uh, uh, numbers have gone way up since uh, Russia invited Ukraine. And you read the article and it says it went up 2%, which is negligible. But the idea is whenever there's this rallying cry that, that people come together. During 9-11, we all came together. And right now, one of the reasons that the U.S. is struggling is we don't have those unifying points. We don't have those things that we're saying, yes, we all stand for this. Seems like half the country is saying we stand for this, and another half is saying, we why do we why do we want to stand for that? That doesn't make any sense. You know, that that's not what we're about here. This is one this isn't what America's about. And there's half of the country that hates America and half the country that loves America. And, and it, because of that message that's not unifying, there's division. And Paul's saying, you ought to all be united under the message of the gospel um, of Christ. Again, how much better when we're not just talking about the national banner of Christianity, but the actual uniting person of Jesus Christ, right? It's a great thing to say, God bless America and have us all come together. How much better for us to say we are Christ and he has taken away our sin. We have a cross where we can go and get the blood that we need to have our sins forgiven so that we can stand before God righteous and that one day we can expect to be in heaven together. How much more unifying is our message? And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, we have a unifying message. We have something that brings us together. Now, what does that look like? One, it looks like understanding the value of the gospel. Notice in verse number two, he says, uh, unto, all, unto all riches. And then in verse number three, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The, word, the words riches and treasure are an invitation to explore the vast resources of what it means to be a child of God, of what it means to be saved. I feel that so often some churches emphasize the fact that you need to get saved, and then they just kind of drop off, like being saved was the end. Uh, what the Bible teaches is that the gospel is more than just being saved, and I'm thankful for that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not putting that down at all. I'm just saying, if you stop there, then you miss all the blessings, all the riches that come with being saved, that come with being a born-again Christian. And there's the, there are vast resources, vast treasures, vast riches that we can explore and take for ourselves, and that we can, in understanding those, um, that we can have what we're going to talk about in a minute here, but um, 
we can have a stronger Christian life. We can have a better, more full of joy and peace and what we're going to see here in verse number two, assurance. So what does it look like? It means understanding the assurance of the gospel. Again, in verse two, uh, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. So assurance. The word assurance here is um, a word, it's, it's, uh, it's actually the word pleroforeo, which is from two words that basically mean, it, it, it's a word that means complete and a word that means to cover yourself like with a, gar with a garment or to wear like a burden. So the idea of assurance is something that completely protects you. We might say body armor, or we might say a, a cloak that you wear all the time. Uh, we, you know, that's like in the wintertime, it's your coat, right? Your coat that you have, that's, that's the one you wear when you're going out because you know it's going to protect you. Um, we too then are to be covered with understanding of the gospel like a cloak, or to invest in our understanding of what it means to be a safe person, what Christ has done for us, and, and wear that all the time. Again, Christianity is not a part-time thing. Christianity is not a Sunday morning thing. It is a Sunday at midnight to Saturday at midnight. Uh, it's all the way. Our Christianity is all the time. And if it's only Sunday morning, then it's, it's not what we're talking about here. And the churches here needed to understand what it meant to be saved and what the gospel meant for them in full assurance. We need to understand that we cannot please God in and of ourselves, that Christ has pleased God for us. And as we abide in the vine, we can finally please God, that it has nothing to do with me and my righteousness. It has everything to do with my submission and surrender and obedience to his righteousness. And we have struggles with giving that up because I want to feel like I'm a good person. When you come to the point where you realize I'm not a good person, but Christ is and I can rely on him. What freedom there is, what assurance there is in that. We need to understand that we can have victory because of the cross. So what does that look like? It looks like understanding the value of the gospel. It understands means uh, understanding the assurance of the gospel. And then finally, understanding God's love for all people. Spreading the gospel. God was mobilizing the church here to know and spread the gospel. And so he uh, he's talking about this and saying, I, I, my hope... My conflict for you is that you would, first of all, uh, be comforted with love, be knit together in love, that you would understand the mystery, that all of the, all of the riches of what it means to be saved, and that you and Christ have been, you and God have been reconciled through Christ, that you would understand that, and that that would spur you to preaching the gospel. And then finally, the church needs to have steadfast faith. Verse 4, again, starts with a warning. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Verse 4 is a warning. He knows that there are some who want to try to draw the Colossians away. Some of these false teachers we're going to talk about in this verse, in this chapter. And, and Paul is not there with them in, in verse 5, he says. But he wants them to know that he keeps them in prayer and that if he could be there, he would. And, and the next best thing he can do is to say, I'm praying for you and I'm sending you this letter to help you understand this. I want you to, he hear, he's hearing reports and he's rejoicing in their faith that they're keeping on. Again, not that there aren't things that he has to address, but he says, for the most part, you're good, and I'm thankful for that. He says here, um, but I, I am with you in spirit, joined and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He's glad for that. Faith, in many ways, is the supply chain of the church. So if love is the blood of the body, faith would be the... Um, Maybe the food. I don't know. <laughs> uh, faith is, uh, we, we, the Christian life runs on faith. That we depend on Christ, we believe God, and we can walk. Trust in Christ is the only way to live the Christian life, and so it has to be on faith. And uh, we've understood, again, over the last year or so, uh, what, I mean, I, before, before two years ago, 
I never really had a very firm grasp on supply chains and how much uh, things from other parts of the world, I guess I just figured that people who know better than I do have it all figured out, they have a foolproof system, you know? They would know what to do if a freighter gets turned sideways in the Suez Canal. You know, that they would know this stuff, or, or they would know what to do when dock workers go on strike or have COVID policies, or they would know what to do if China just decides to not send us things, you know? And it turns out they don't. We've learned so much about supply chains and just how fragile we all are. <laughs> we think, well, yeah, you know, I go to Walmart and it's just, there's just, it's always on the shelf, you know? And then you go in and Caleb and his coworkers are all on strike or something, I don't know. And there's, you know, there's no pasta on the shelf. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here, you know? And so we, uh, we understand this supply chain issue. The, 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 the difference is that faith is always available, you know? We, we understand the scarcity. If there's any scarcity of faith, it's because I'm not, it's because I'm not eating, not because it's not there. Uh, there's always promises of God. There's always prompting of God. And there's always uh, God's presence that I need to depend on. And if there's any scarcity, it's on my part, not his. So what does that look like? What does it look like to have an emphasis on faith, this steadfastness of faith? One, I, again, I think it doesn't express, ex, explicitly say that in the text, but I think an emphasis on the word. Um, you can't have faith without promises, and you can't have promises without the word. You need to know what God's promise so that you can believe them. We need to be digging in, finding from the Word of God, and meditating on truth. And as we do that, we'll grow, not only in our own walk, but as a church, we'll grow. As we, as a church, make a culture of dependence on Christ, uh, that encourages one another. We see someone who's depending on their own flesh, we can say, brother, we'll just tell you that's not going to work. Sister, I know that you want to try this in your own flesh. It's not going to work. We're encouraging one another to faith. But it also looks like order. There's this careful arrangement and established confirmation. He says in verse number five, I'm with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. The words order and steadfastness are military terms. Uh, and he writes his orderly and, and steadfast are probably military metaphors. The church is drawn up in proper battle array with a solid wall of defense, namely its faith in Christ. Paul is there in spirit, like a general inspecting the troops before a battle. And Paul is not there. He can only do so much, but he says, I'm hearing about your faith, and that is what's going to protect you. That is what is going to help your church and help you help the other churches to grow and to flourish. It also, again, looks like a continued walk. Verse number six says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, verses 6 through 10 and other passages, those are for next week. But you see where he's going with this, where he says, Church, I'm writing to you because my desire is for the things that you need. You need love. You need to be able to comfort one another in love. You need understanding of the gospel, which will bring assurance. And it will bring... Uh, wisdom and knowledge. You need a steadfast faith. And, and I'm praying for you, I'm fighting for you, that you can have those things. Now, these are things, again, that we cannot obtain. I said earlier, you know, if, if money, building, people, resources, talents were no issue, what would we as a church need? Well, despite all those things, the things that we need are free. We need love in order to operate well. Love is, is free. We need, we need the, an understanding of the gospel. That's free. We need, an understand, we need to have a steadfast faith, an emphasis on the word that bolsters our faith. That's free as well. We have everything we need. We have everything we need as a church to be able to move forward. 
And uh, so let's move forward in this. It was Paul's prayer for them. I, I suspect that if he's writing to us today, it would be Paul's blood 